Hi, I'm Don from Don Drones On, and welcome to the January update on my Starlink internet experience. January was a bit of a roller coaster month with lots of ups and a really big down. Let's get into it. Well, there are now over 145,000 of us Starlink owners worldwide, with dishes popping up in 25 countries. And for the most part, people seem to absolutely love it. Certainly for folks in remote regions or even moderately rural areas, Starlink solves a huge problem brilliantly. Massive bandwidth, fantastic speed, and reasonably good uptime in places where conventional internet access is either non-existent, underpowered, or unreliable. Certainly for our cottage location and the kind of online all the time jobs and leisure activities my wife and I are into, it has been an absolute game changer since March of last year. A huge thank you to Elon and the Starlink crew. For those of you who have been following my channel, you'll know that it has not always been so rosy, particularly in the early days with frequent outages and pretty erratic speeds. But things have improved tremendously, particularly in the last few months. Let's have a look at the statistics I've been tracking. My first metric is the number of dropout events per hour. A dropout is any short outage of 11 seconds or more. Outages less than 11 seconds are essentially unnoticeable, even in an, e in an MS Teams or Zoom call. You might get a short freeze up on the video or warbling on the audio, but really not a big deal. And of course, any sort of one-way streaming video system like Netflix or YouTube buffers enough data that you generally won't notice short outages like this. So in January, I experienced 0.1 dropouts per hour, roughly one or two outages a day. And you'll notice on the table under the graph, I had to resort to two decimal points to even show the numbers. And I had a few days where there were no outages at all showing on the app, which is tremendous. Well, except this is the up part of the roller coaster. So let's look at the next metric. My second metric is total downtime, measured in outage minutes per day. And this is where the roller coaster screamed down the hill, went off the rails and flipped upside down. This big blue part of the January candle is due to the one hour and a half outage we had on January the 7th. And I wasn't alone. It appears that the outage was global. Everyone with Starlink blinked out of existence for 90 minutes or so. Now, I was pretty lucky. I was at work, I work re remotely, but not in a web meeting, so I didn't even notice for a few minutes. When I did notice, I checked the router and saw the red light. Then I checked that the dish was still up on the roof, and it was. Then I connected my phone to cell service and discovered Facebook lit up with reports from all over the world. Hey, I've lost Starlink. It looked like we were in a period of stone knives and bearskins, so I cooked up a hotspot on my phone and carried on with the morning. It was bad, but not the end of the world. On my chart, I marked this outage as no satellites, just to make it distinct. And you'll notice that I've broken out the myriad reasons associated with other outages into no signal, which means a connection issue from the dish to a satellite, and network issue, which means a connection issue from the satellite down to the ground station and, in, and the internet. I would say that roughly half of these issues in January happened in the 24 hours after that big outage as the network and the dish settled down. Starlink has not issued any official statement about the root cause of that outage, but clearly it was some sort of terrible software glitch at the entire network level or more likely some ill-advised network setting that blew away everyone's connection. The fact that they were able to fix it so fast certainly points to a network setting and not hardware or software, but that's just my speculation. One little curiosity that popped out of this event on social media was the Starlink customer service response to at least one user. As you can see here, they actually said that Starlink was still in beta and outages should be expected. 
But hang on, Elon said it was out of beta at the end of October. Their website no longer mentions beta. And again, at least one customer service response in the past has said, yeah, they're out of beta. It is a bit strange that Starlink customer service doesn't have a consistent hymn sheet, but does it really matter? No. Every network of all kinds suffers outages for one reason or another from time to time. It's just a fact of life. Oh, to round off my metrics, how about speed? Download speed in January was about the same as December with an average of 114 megabits per second down. The lowest I measured was 13 megs down, which was during a strong windstorm. I am absolutely sure the dish was being buffeted around like crazy, and that led to some packet retransmits and slower speed settings. The fastest I saw was 240. The nice thing, as you can see on this histogram, is that the speed has become very much more predictable again, with a strong clustering of samples in the 100 to 100, 150 meg range. Upload speed averaged 10, which is again pretty typical. Ping or latency averaged 54 milliseconds, a bit high, but certainly again in the typical range that I've been measuring. One other thing, I mentioned the high winds seemed to cause some degradation, but I didn't mention snow. We were hit with a storm on January the 16th that dumped about a foot of the white stuff over about six hours. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, I was not at the cottage at the time. So I was not able to witness any degradation or to see how well the snow melted off the dish. Hopefully I'll be there next time when we're blessed with snow. That said, there is now a new feature in the app to give you more control over the ice melting function of the dish. I had actually assumed, honestly, that this so-called ice melting feature was simply the heat of the electronics, but it seems that it is actually an active and controllable heating system. With the new feature, you can choose between turning the heater off entirely to save power, setting it to automatic, where it says automatically detects snow and heats up when needed, or preheat, which it says will keep the dish warm to better resist snow buildup. And there's a warning on that last one that says this may increase power consumption. These options will be really appreciated by folks who live off the grid, where every watt of power consumption really matters. Nice improvement, Elon. Well, that's it for January. Some stats about our growing Starlink user community, an update on my performance metrics, my perspectives on that big outage, and the new heater options in the app. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications of my next update.